Let's talk about uh, what do I know is fear avoidance beliefs questionnaire. Or the FabQ. I know there are a couple of things in town here who use the FabQ, I think, as part of their initial intake package. It's got two subscales, the physical activity subscale and the work activity subscale. Now one thing to notice is that um, while it appears as though the first, the first scale is obviously the physical activities and the second scale is obviously work, you don't use every item in the calculation of those subscores. So uh, for physical activity you use items 2 through 5, and for work activities you use items 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 15. So this is intended to capture exaggerated Fear of pain and avoidance. Let's take a look at those, those items again. Look at that scale that's in your package there. Does it all appear to be exaggerated? Is there anything, is there anything in there that appears to be perfectly rational, do you think? Give me an example here. First question, my pain was caused by physical activity. First question, my pain was caused by physical activity. And in fact, that's actually why it's not included in the uh, subscale score on that one. Because you're right, it's yes or no. <laughs> in fact, the fact that it's on an uh, opinion-based scale is a bit strange, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a yes or no, usually. Um, absolutely. Anything else in there that... I mean, would you look at... Uh, if you look at scores on here, you go, wow, this is clearly irrational. I feel like number four and number five are somewhat interchangeable. Number four and five, which ones are those in there? You should not do the... Or I should not do physical activities which might make my pain worse. First of all, is that irrational, do you think? I should not do physical activities which might make my pain worse. Maybe, maybe not. I cannot do physical activities which might make my pain worse. So, it's somewhat interchangeable is, is the comment there. Let me see, is there a difference between should not and cannot? I would agree, they're probably very close, <laughs> very related. Um, if we, for those of you familiar with the ICF model, the can, can do, can't do sort of thing taps into a participation level uh, item. That um, it's probably slightly different versus the should not do, which is more of a sort of activity level item. Which is neither here nor there, but. The fact is, they're probably slightly different, but very related. And I would think that you could probably get away with just asking one of those questions. And then there's another question here. Um, in the work subscale, there's one item there that is especially prognostic for trying to predict return to work. One single item that is very prognostic. Which one do you think it is? <laughs> I don't think I'll go back to work, so there's either the, I don't think I'll go back to work within uh, three months, or I don't think that I'll ever be able to go back to work. A couple things about that. First of all, um, there's been some work done, and in fact, that single question, do you think you'll be back to work in X number of months, is probably as prognostic as the rest of the entire scale. So you could probably get away with just that one question. Another thing from a measurement perspective, and this is another thing that I say, look at your scales, look at your tools, make sure you're choosing good tools. If I endorse that final question and say, I don't think I'll ever go back to work, what do you think my response is going to be to the question before that? I don't think I'll go back to work in three months. Clearly, it's going to be the same thing, right? In fact, that that's the previous question becomes irrelevant, right? Um, that's a concept uh, we, relate, uh, we call um, location dependence which is where the response to one item is necessarily dependent on the response to another item. Any of, some of you who are still students or who are recently students will probably recognize that there's a bit of a strategy involved in sometimes answering multiple choice questions on a test because you can usually, if you read further down, a subsequent question may actually give you the answer to the question above, right? Same kind of deal here, okay? So this actually is arguably a little bit problematic from a measurement perspective. Again, the FabQ is being around forever. I'm not trying to be critical. Um, I don't think I could create necessarily a better scale. I just say this because I want everyone here to become educated and good measurement tool users. And as you see new scales come out, make sure you take the time to go over them and make sure they make sense. 
on balance, between those two subscales, the work subscale certainly seems to have more value than the physical activity subscale does um, from a prognostic standpoint and from a responsiveness standpoint. Um, let's see here. Here we go. Fritz and George, 2002, when assessed within one week of acute low back pain, the FabQ work subscale score of 34 or greater, and so you can see what sort of high score cutoffs are here, 15 for the physical activity and 34 for the work, offers a positive likelihood ratio of 3.33 for not back to work after four weeks. Now I can't leave it at that. You're all here, we're talking about measurement and assessment. What's a positive likelihood ratio mean? You know how to interpret those? You should. Some of my students, students should have a sense of what those are all about. What's a what's a big likelihood ratio? You know? Something that really leads to a clinically meaningful shift in a likelihood that a condition exists. So generally, generally speaking, I'll let you know. Um, you know, a PLR over two is offers at least maybe some utility in determining whether a condition exists. In this case, the condition is a risk for not returning to work, but it's pretty small. Five or greater is giving you moderate clinical utility, and certainly anything about in that eight to ten or higher range is definitely going to be clinically useful for determining whether a condition exists. As an example, let's do this. Let's imagine that 30% um, of people following a low back injury, an acute low back injury, are not back at work after four weeks. Okay? So in that case, patient comes into me, all I see is a referral that says acute low back injury, occupation related, work related. Right off the bat, without knowing anything about that patient, the pretest probability that they're not going to be back to work in four weeks is 30%. Okay. I take that from the published evidence that tells me 30% of people are not back to work after four weeks. While they're sitting out in the waiting room, I have them fill out the FabQ, Fear Avoidance Police Questionnaire. And I look at the work subscale and I, I add it up, that's per the instructions there. And let's say I get a score of 34 or higher. And I know based on the work that was just cited, Steve, George, and Julie Fritz have told us positive likelihood ratio of 3.33 in that case, that they're in the high risk for not return to work group. What that means, what we can do is we can take this little thing, it's called a nomogram, if anyone's ever seen this, this is like a cheater's way of doing the math on odds and probabilities. Fine, I love to cheat. Um, if I start at my pretest probability of 30%, I say they're positive on the test, and I try and pass a straight line through that 3.33 likelihood ratio, I come out on the other end at about 63%, give or take. So we're talking about what is it that positive likelihood ratios mean. What this does is it shifts the likelihood or the probability that somebody's in, in this case, a high risk group. And so here, depending on where you start, you get a bit of a shift and you end up somewhere, in this case, more likely. So in this case, instead of a 30% risk, it's now a 63% risk that they're in that or a 63% chance they're in that high risk group. Okay. So we talked about what we can use these things for. Well, that's, a, that's one thing you can use it for. Trying to establish a prognosis. Another thing you can use it for, if this is a high score, that may again be one of those initial treatment focuses that you, OSI, uh, that you want to shoot at, is trying to address the fear. Right? Trying to explore the reasons for that fear. And again, those of us in this sort of rehab uh, sector are actually pretty good uh, being able to explain this idea that hurt doesn't equal harm, that you maybe don't need to be 100% recovered before you go back and you know, reinitiate your activities, all those sorts of things. We can actually take the time usually and explain that to people. Well, I learned, we're pretty good at it. So I think this gives us some, uh, a real nice sort of first step for, uh, for treatment options.